Ladies and gentlemen, this is Adam Kokush here at the Unconvention in Omaha, Nebraska with Steve Sheets, my friend from Pennsylvania who is running for Congress in Pennsylvania's 1st District, and he is also a candidate for LNC Vice Chair. Steve, thanks so much for joining us. Now, you were just telling me about, you have, you have, like, you have a really cool day job, and I guess we don't talk about day jobs enough in the LP, mostly because we're all trying to avoid having them, but apparently you still have one. That's how you're able to be a financial supporter of the party who puts his money where his mouth is. It was really cool. We were able to become lifetime members of LPPA at the same time at this last convention, also lifetime national member. But uh, w what's your day job? All right, I'm in, I'm in innovation. I design colors. I put effect pigment in with regular colors and we do this for Ford, for GM, for Chrysler, all the automotive manufacturers, aircraft manufacturers, even cookware manufacturers. And hopefully sooner or later, we're gonna get into the electronics business as well. But it's a, it's a lot of fun when we make this happen. So you're, you're like a color design, like, I mean, I, I, I love this. At the same time, I'm sort of like, couldn't a monkey with like a, a, a color wheel and like all the palettes just, w but you're, you're, you, there's obviously, there's, it's either that or it's like super genius, perfect, like there's a science that goes into this. How, how do you get compensated? How do you provide value for that car should be that color? It's the artistic process really. And it's not just the color that I design, but the story that goes along with it. For example, one of my latest marketing tools, I call it the extreme. I use, <laughs> you're laughing at me, I get it, I get it. But basically I've taken extreme environments or things in extreme environments and I use that as inspiration for the colors. For example, Red Rocks outside of Vegas, I made a red that was based on Red Rocks. And the way that this red works, it shifts so that it, you can see when the red of the rocks in the sunlight versus the red in the shade, depending on how you're looking at it on the panel of the car, you'll see that color shift from shade to sunlight. It's kind of a really neat effect. So you're talking about reflecting the, the red-orange spectrum of that in a, wow, okay. Yeah. And it's, I'm putting it on a Ferrari, or I'm, putting it on, <laughs> or I'm putting it on a Viper, or whatever, or whoever wants it. It's, it's, a really, it's a really neat color. There's another color that I made that is based on the sun reflecting off the little ripples as the wind blows down the channel of the Hetch Hetchy Valley. And it looks you're good, you're good like at selling that. it. It looks just like that. You know, it's this beautiful blue of the water. And it has the sunlight sparkling in just a certain way. When you're standing on this valley, and to give you an idea of this valley, uh, a lot of people were upset when they filled this in with water because they needed a, they needed a reservoir for San Francisco. Well, I disagree. I'm standing there in the valley looking at this water and I'm feeling the breeze blowing down the channel and the sunlight's just blasting on me. It's just magnificent. It's a beautiful place to be. It takes your breath away. And then you see the sunlight reflecting off the little ripples and that was my inspiration. You know, when I see that, when I see that, I'm like, we need something just like this. And it's not often that you see a blue with a gold sparkle to it. But you don't really notice the sparkle so much until the sunlight hits it. When you see it, you say, yeah, that will take me right there to that valley. Mm -hmm. This is like every five-year-old boy's dream job. I mean, I hate to keep making fun of you for this, but like, it's just too perfect. Like every five-year-old with a box of crayons coloring in cars, if you told him, hey, you could do that for a living someday, he'd be like, yeah, screw growing up to be an astronaut. I want to be the car color picker. That is such a cool job. That's uh, Anyway, this is... Uh, I want to I want to bridge from that to, to being libertarian. How did you how did you wake up? How did you become a libertarian or realize that you're a libertarian? Well, my biological mother and my adopted mother will both tell you that I was an anarchist since the day I was born. But actually realizing what liberty was and what libertarianism was, that happened while I was in high school. Um, I believe that was 1980, I'm going to really date myself here, I'm sorry, 1987, I listened to this guy, Irv Homer, in, on Philadelphia radio, and he started talking, and his talking points were from the libertarian spectrum. I'm like, wow, this guy makes a lot of sense. So I started doing a little bit of research on my own, and, and everybody else was either a Democrat or a Republican. My mom was a Democrat, my, my dad was a Republican, and every, everybody's family is that way, and that's how they developed their own political identity. 
it's what you see. I didn't go that route. I kind of picked my own path. I was a registered Republican for a very, very, very long time, but I supported. Yeah, nobody's perfect. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. It's good to know you're better now. Uh, definitely, it's definitely good that I'm better now. <laughs> but yeah, I, I worked on I worked on libertarian campaigns you know, in 1994, and moving forward, I was in and out of the movement. I became a county chair. I was a county secretary for a while, and and then I actually became the chairman of the Libertarian Party of Pennsylvania. But I I became a libertarian, a registered libertarian, back I think in 2010, and became a member of the National Party for the first time. It was probably shortly before Columbus, but once I went to Columbus, all of a sudden I fell in love with the Libertarian Love Fest that was out there, and, and it made me want to get more involved nationally, and that's why I'm here. And it's just, it's one of those things, you, you go there in 2014, and you say, okay, I'm definitely going to go to the next one, definitely going to go to the next one. Next one rolls around, and you are there, and you walk on that floor, and well, at that particular point, I was a Pennsylvania delegation chair, because I was the chairman of the party at the time. And I just was wowed by that experience. It was just so fun and it was so awesome. And everybody that was down there was there to do one thing and that was make our nation more free, bring liberty to our lives. And you know, when I say that I'm in innovation right now, I bridge my work uh, with liberty all the time because you know, what we're trying to do in our nation is innovate. We're innovating our way to a brand new future, a brave new world, because so many people, we sit here and we are conditioned to believe that there is only one way, one way to, to politically survive in our nation. And it's wrong. It's just the wrong way to do it. There's all kinds of different ways. One of, my, one of the phrases that I absolutely positively hate, and I, there's very few things in this world that I hate, but the phrase, that's impossible. It makes me cringe, it makes me angry, and I say, no, this is not impossible. It might take me a little bit longer, but it is not impossible. And I will stand up and I will climb that hill. I don't care how many times somebody tells me it's impossible, I will die trying. It's good to hear it like that. So uh, maybe, maybe that is the answer to my next question, but I, I do have to ask uh, something about the, the vice chair's race that you're facing right now, because uh, it's a very interesting year for the LP. I mean, uh, you saw it in, in Pennsylvania. The delegation was filled. I happen to be a member, and I w we'll tell that backstory another time. But uh, we have backstory. <laughs> we we have uh, almost every single state in the country has been competitive this year in the delegate race. That is unheard of in LP history. Very exciting time to be in the party, and your race is to replace Arvin Vorha, who is running for re-election as vice chair who's largely thought of as not having a chance at winning re-election because of the you know, controversial and, and, and I would at least say in some ways counterproductive messaging strategy that he's adopted. Hopefully I'll get a chance to catch him this weekend and get a little serious debate with that strategic uh, st uh question on, on camera here. But uh, you do have a very crowded field and, and, and you do have some really great candidates. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, I don't think we're going to go wrong with a vice chair in this race. Uh, you know, and, and, and all of the candidates are, are you know, really bring something to the table. So as vice chair, what is the, the most unique thing of value that you bring to the party? Well, like I said, I've been a state chair. I know how to run the meetings. That's, that's fairly second nature. Boilerplate skill set. Right. It, and, but the other thing about it is, and the thing that I want to do is I want to create an atmosphere where people will want to come. I want to facilitate communications between them. I want to facilitate communications between novice candidates and candidates that have been around for a while. I want to help create a mentorship program where people can hone their skills, create that clear, concise, consistent, professional message. You know, you were talking about with Arvind Pura. I don't believe some of his messaging is really all that professional because it alienates certain people. And we're not such a large movement that we can afford to alienate people. We have to bring people together. And I've done that in Pennsylvania. We had a couple instances where I've had to bring together Republicans, Democrats, Green Party people, communists, socialists, libertarians, the whole political gamut, man. And we all worked on different projects together. We all brought our own spin to these projects, but we all worked together. 
And I believe we can make that happen again. And I think we need to make that happen again if we want something to happen in our nation. So as, as George W. would have said, he's a uniter, not a divider. <laughs> Steve Sheets, ladies and gentlemen. Steve, are there any websites you want to promote for, for either of these campaigns? SteveForOne.com will, will get you to my candidate page for Congress. All right. Thank you very much, brother. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube. And you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at thefreedomline.com and we'll share it on my feed.